Tonight we're going to be making a yellow rice with a braised chicken tinga, chipotle chicken tinga, and a delicious sangria. Hey guys, welcome to Richland Library's Evening Arts Culinary Edition. My name is David Grillo. I'm the executive chef for Cantina 76, and this is my wife, Cheryl. And we're here to uh, have date night and share some cooking and fun food with you all. And uh, we're going to start off with some wonderful sangria cocktail for you. All right, so the first step that we're going to do is the best part, I think, is making sangria. Um, it is one of our favorite cocktails at home. We make it all the time because it's very user friendly and you can switch out with things you have at home. So it's not, you don't have to go with these exact ingredients. You can make total changes to kind of fit what you guys are looking for. So first things first, grab a pitcher, any kind of pitcher you have at home, and we're going to start with adding our fruit. You can put any kind of fruit. Um, it is totally up to you. Apples, lemons, limes, oranges, whatever you guys have. Um, today, we're going to do some blackberries, some pomegranate, some oranges, and an apple. And I'm just going to show you guys how to cut an apple. Um, if you are like me and culinary challenged a little, these kind of tips help me. So make sure first you totally wash your apple very good because it's going obviously in your drink. So you want to get anything off of it um, ahead of time. Hold it on its side. Kind of curl your fingers so you don't chop your fingers because we don't want to lose anything during our date night, right? So first put it on the side and we're just going to cut one big cut to kind of get the end off. And then we're just going to go and cut slices. And you can do it as thin or thick as you would like. So take your apples and I like to cut them in fours. Um, to kind of break it up a little bit so they're not so big and then just start putting them in your pitcher So do that with your whole apple um, Here I'm taking my blackberries and again, you can put however much you want um, These are typically, you know, we'll put a whole apple a whole orange um, Take your pomegranates put that in um, I'm gonna grab over here. I'm gonna take my oranges and again, you know, I would recommend cutting them in fours, but you don't have to um, that's totally your call. Um, and then just kind of put it all in there. And I would recommend making this in advance. I think you want to have it ready. Throw it in your fridge. You could even do it the night before. Um, so all of the juices and everything get mixed in really well together. So you really take advantage of all these awesome ingredients that you're putting in here. So after I put all my fruit in here, then I'm gonna get to the good stuff. So here, you can use any kind of Spanish wine. Um, we have a Pinot Noir, but there is, you can use any kind. Um, and you can get them at any store. So a grocery store, a wine store, whichever. So your preference here. But we literally put the whole bottle in and just mixing that all up in there. All right, so after, and I'll leave this out here, we'll have all the ingredients that we used um, in case you guys want to try it. Um, this is one of our favorites that we get a lot. So we pour our wine in, and then our next step is we're gonna take um, a cognac. We are using brandy, so you pour that in there. It is, um, you know, you can put a little or half, um, whatever. This, we are typically use about half of a cup. Um, but it's a pandemic, so feel free to put a little bit more. Um, and then I'm gonna add my triple sec and my simple syrup. Um, we use simple syrup, but I mean, feel free. You can also put a little bit of maple syrup in there. Um, we do that some too, just to kind of, if you want it super sweet, I would go that direction. If not, maybe go something a little thinner like a simple syrup. So then I'm gonna add my orange juice. Oh, this already looks amazing. Um, and then I'm gonna put a little bit of pomegranate juice in there. And then 
I'm pretty well done. So after, if I was at home, I would throw this in the fridge, let it sit for a little while. But then your finished product, you just take two fun glasses, put some ice in it, pour your drink in there, get a spoon, take some of the fruit in there, put it in there, and then you're totally done. And then you have a finished product. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to date night at the library. So good. No, no it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Don't listen to that. Delicioso. It's amazing. All right, a couple tips when you're making a sangria. Uh, your pomegranate juice that we used is available already done. Um, this is good quality palm. It's pure. It's great for making grenadine too if you want to make some from scratch. Uh, they also, your grocery store will sell these pomegranate seeds already clean, ready to go. It saves the work and hassle, but by all means, fresh is better if you want to do it that way. Um, I use, because we have this at the restaurant, I use a pre-made triple sec. You can use one that is non-alcoholic. You can use one that has alcohol in it if you'd like, but it's good stuff you can get it at your, at your uh, uh, local uh, alcohol store, Red Dot store, whatever have you. Um, the wine that we used was a uh, dry, semi-sweet Pinot Noir. Just talk to your, your rep at your store that you're getting it from and they'll steer you in the right direction to make it simple and easy. And all of these ingredients are very simple, very affordable, so enjoy. All right, next we're gonna start on our, our yellow rice for our dish, okay? And um, I like to use a long grain rice. If you want a little more flavor in there, you can use a basmati or a jasmine rice, a little buttery flavor, a little more aromatics, but typically just straight, good old fashioned, long grain rice is good, okay? We're gonna start with our pot and we're gonna get it warm first. And then after it starts to take the chill off the stainless steel, off the pot, okay? We're gonna turn the heat up. And then um, Cheryl's gonna add here two tablespoons of canola oil. I like to use canola oil because it's got a high, high temp point. It doesn't burn. You're welcome to use coconut oil for another element of flavor, a little more richness. You could use uh, olive oil and butter together if you would like. Any type of oil is fine as long as it's not going to scorch or burn, all right? Okay, so we got our, our, our uh, pot hot, and then Cheryl's going to add two cups of long grain rice. And um, when, when I make my rice, I like to impart my Sicilian heritage in there and put a little bit of browning or toasting on the rice. And this adds another element of flavor, kind of like we do in risotto. And what you do when you put the rice in the pan, you're going to crank your heat up and you're going to start to hear it sizzle and crack. And as you go to stir it, you want to stir it in the same direction. Whatever that direction you choose is, is your call. You can stir it clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever one is best for you. The idea for stirring it in the same direction is it's not going to break the grains up as you're moving them around and you end up with a bunch of rice crumble instead of nice grains of rice, okay? So, it's gonna reach in there and it's gonna take a minute. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be a fast process and it's definitely something you don't wanna walk away. Keep an eye on it and make sure it's not scorching or burning, all right? You just wanna get a nice light golden brown on your rice. All right, so our rice is starting to brown a little bit, okay? You can see a little bit of smoke coming off the pot, almost like when you're making popcorn stovetop. It's got the same smell and everything, all right? And um, you'll see the rice, the grains are starting to toast on the ends and get a little bit of golden brown color to them. That's as far as you want to take it. If they start to get black, you're taking it too far, okay? Um, Cheryl, if you want to go ahead and add this stock, and before you do, I'm going to mention, Use a tall pot when you do this because this pan is hot and this stock is going to bubble and splatter and splash, okay? So, Sherry, you go ahead and pour it. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, so that was our four cups of chicken stock. Anytime you make standard rice, it's always, you know, two parts liquid to one part dry. So we did two cups of rice and four cups of stock. So we're gonna mix that up real good. And then Cheryl, um, if you wanna add the saffron, and uh, this recipe I've put six threads of saffron in there to give it color. 
Um, if you want a, a deep, deep, rich color, you can add a little more, but, but six to eight is about good. If you put too much in there, you're gonna impart a different flavor than what you're going for, okay? Um, the next ingredient that we're gonna put in here is some ground anetto. And um, anetto comes from the Echiote uh, plant, and it's a dried seed. They grind up, it adds color and just a little bit of flavor to your dishes, but it's natural ingredient. It's not a food dye or food coloring, it's a natural ingredient. So um, this is gonna give your rice a nice bright, bright yellow color, okay? And I'm a big fan with my food. I want the color to pop. I want things to, to, to really catch your eye first, catch your nose second, and catch your palate third. But um, on a romantic date night, it, you want some nice, bright, colorful, flavorful food. Bring everyone together and have a good time. And the smell is amazing. Like, it smells so good. Well, and it's the nice part about toasting it, toasting the rice, is it, it brings that rice back to where it came from, what it is. It, it, you, you can smell that this is a toasted grain in your pot. Cook it in a chicken stock with your nice uh, flavoring ingredients. And it smells okay. kind of like popcorn. Did you mention yes, that? Yes, it Yeah, does. it really it does. does smell like popcorn. Cool, so we're gonna cover this guy and uh, we're gonna cut the heat down. Um, on an electric stove, I would say low is good. Um, on a gas stove, till the flame's almost out, okay? And let this thing take its time. We're in no rush. Slower is better with this guy and um, it's going to help the starch and everything kind of create its own texture of thickness and, and just overall goodness. So cool. And that's your yellow rice. So we're going to talk about mincing garlic. All right. Um, you can buy the garlic at the store in the clove already cleaned if you'd like. You can buy the, the garlic whole, you know. Um, I think for myself, I like to buy the garlic and clean it and peel it myself. I think for Cheryl, if she's doing any cooking, we want to get the, the clothes already, already done, done because it's simple, it's quick. And, you know, date nights only come so often, as you know. And if Grammy's got the kids, we're on time. We're getting to time the point. Constraint. Yeah, we got to get to the point. So, you know, faster, simpler is better, all right? Um, when you go to mince garlic, it's a real simple process. I'm sure you've seen it on the TV shows all the time. You want to take a nice heavy knife if you got one. If not, any knife will do, just as long as it's wide enough, you know, and just smash it. Use your strength. You don't have to make a bunch of noise, breaking glasses or anything like that. Just lean into it and crush that garlic. And then you're gonna take your knife and come through and you're gonna slice it. As small as you can get it, as small as you're comfortable without cutting your fingers. And one way to ensure that, that I'll talk to you about, is always make sure your fingers are curled. Right? You want to make sure that your pinky and your thumb are hanging out having a conversation and that your index finger is the, the knuckle that you use to guide the knife across to the food. You move the knife to the food, not the food to the knife. You'll surely cut yourself otherwise, okay? So, and it works. It totally works. I may not have demonstrated it correctly on my apple, but it works. I so you can still it. count to 10. Yes. So just come back, slice it again, mix it up. Get everything off the knife and just keep slicing it until it gets to a mince. A mince is a, a, the smallest chop you can get to where the ingredient that you're breaking down is not going to give you a strong bite or mouthful of this. You wouldn't want to bite into a huge piece of garlic in your chicken tanga, especially with that chipotle in there. The garlic's going to come across very aggressive and take away from all the other wonderful flavors we have. And right now in this recipe, the garlic is to be a flavor enhancement. So this is about what we're looking for right here. If you can see, nice and small pieces. Good? Awesome. Okay, next we're gonna talk about saboyas, onions, okay? Uh, for this recipe, I'm just using a standard large yellow onion. Um, you wanna peel it and get all the skin off that you can. Try not to waste any of the the pulp or the flesh of the onion that you want to try to use as much as you can, okay? Um, onions are going to make you cry, okay? There's no two ways around it. There's all these tricks and techniques to make it so it doesn't make you cry. Putting bread in your mouth, soaking them in ice water, whatever. Just cut the onion, okay? Get it over with, right? So a sharp knife is going to help stop a lot of that. Got to use a sharp knife, okay? Um, 
In culinary school, we talk about Frenching an onion, so I want to show you that technique real quick, and it's to simplify things so you're not wrestling with the thing all the time. Always leave the, the core or the root end on the onion so that the onion can stay whole. You cut the flower part or the tip of the onion off first, all right? So when you cut it, try to waste as little of the onion as possible, and then you're going to half your onion. So you leave the other end on there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you can see this one's a juicy one. It's already got, got the onion milk coming out of it. That's what gets in your eyes and makes you look like you've been watching Little House on the Prairie. So um, you keep the core intact, all right? With your knife, you're going to come across the onion using your knuckles again to guide the cut, all right? This is going to be a julienne. When you julienne an onion you don't want to cut with the grain of the onion you'll end up with a bunch of half rings and pieces that'll crumble and fall apart that's what i normally do so he is correct about that <laughs> so what we want to do is uh we want to have a nice straight piece so that when it goes in our chicken tenga you've got this nice shredded onion that you're pulling off with your rice and it makes it a little more delectable okay so you're going to come across the onion start with your knife on a little bit of an angle if you can see that Okay, and you're not going to cut all the way to the end of the onion. You're only going to cut to about right here. And the core is what's going to leave that onion whole for you, okay? So you're going to come across and straighten your knife as you come across the onion. And what you'll see is you have your julienne already intact on the onion like so. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get that cut across. And this is honestly like the only way to get that small, like so it's not too thick and that's all that you taste because that is, that is not what we want on date night. So we save this for pico salsa. Pico. You would cut the root off, chop it up, puree it in your salsa, all right? And then what we have left is a nice julienne onion. As they say in Georgia, Vidalia, that's an onion. That's a dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> so see, this is the cut we're going for. And boy, does that onion, it's got right in your face. It's ready to go. But it's these right pieces, let's just show one. I mean, it's so, it's great. Like it's, it's, it gives you the flavor, but without so much of that intense. If that is complicated and you don't want to mess with it, I like the simple American way of cutting the onion. Cut the core off. And just go for it. get halfway, roll your onion, and start over. And there you go. Julienne onion. All right, we want to check our rice to make sure it's done properly, okay? And what we're looking for is not mush your clump together, but uh, you don't want it crunchy in the middle, okay? You want a nice little bite. And the rice is going to have a chew to it. Our rice is perfect. It's done. One of the nice things about this dish on date night, you hand me the lid and we'll cover this. So what Cheryl's going to do, she's going to cover the rice. We're just going to let it sit and keep it warm. And it's done. Good to go. Now, if could you, you also use a rice cooker? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it'd be the same thing. You would just follow your technique on the rice cooker. Rice okay. cookers are fun because when you tell your liquid to dry ratio, you just rest your knuckle on the top of the rice. And one knuckle, no matter how big or small your hand is, is always enough liquid. Okay. So, because yeah. that may be a little more user friendly for you know if you're busy with kids. So. Absolutely. Um, even the uh, Instapots make perfect Instapots rice all the time. Are... So. Yes. Pretty good. Yes. Um, in the Instapot too, you can toast the rice. Yeah. So. That's I've seen. I've technique. seen it. I've seen. <laughs> right. I've seen the Instapot. It's awesome. So, and on date night too, with the kids gone and we're on a time frame, if you only got if Grammy's like, hey, I'm only watching them for an hour or two, you can make this the night before and re-therm it in the finishing oven mm -hmm. or on your stove top or in your oven on a low temperature. So it's very user friendly for date night. If you and it's just as good time. if you cook it the night before and reheat it or, I mean, it is, it's, it's we've had it both and it's, it's really good. Yeah, these, these recipes um, are full of flavor and they, they tend to intensify as they rest. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like spaghetti sauce, you know. And if it's a little dry, could you just add like a little water while a you're reheating A little bit of chicken stock while oh, you're reheating chicken stock, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. So. All right, so now we're gonna make our uh, chicken tinga. 
all right? And I want to talk to you about a couple of the ingredients in here. Um, first, we're going to talk about our chicken, all right? And I've got some, some chunk breast meat chicken because it was what I had available, and it's simple and easy, all right? If you would like to use, I like the flavor of dark meat a lot better than white meat. It's got much more flavor, much more texture, much more fat content. It sears beautifully. The skin will get crispy when you brown it in a pan, and you could, if you wanted to, put this recipe together without the chicken, sear the chicken in a frying pan, get that skin nice and crispy, and then add it in and braise it that way, okay? Being date night, quick and simple, okay? Uh, I just wanted to keep this that way for us, for our sake, all right? So I'm gonna get my pot going. I'm gonna get it hot. Um, I like to use a pan that has a heavy bottom on it. If you notice, this cookware has an extra thick bottom on it. It helps prevent scorching and burning. So you can sear in this pot and then braise or stew however you want to. So it's a good pot for and that. And we've had that pot forever. I mean, yeah. it, it has seen some abuse, so I won't yeah. say the brand that it is, but bam, it's some great stuff and it works really good. So um, a nice stainless steel gets anything out of it yeah. nice and clean. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you can see how in good condition it is. It's, it's just a good quality pot. We've made Play-Doh for our kids and that thing comes right out. Just a side note. So we're gonna start off by getting the pan nice and hot. I've got three tablespoons of Earl, as we say in the South. Um, you know, I, I think you could use lard in this if you wanted to. You could use tallow, you could use duck fat, you could use coconut oil. I'm just using canola oil, simple, easy. It's what I have on hand. Nothing is that crucial here. The most important part about this dish and about uh, uh, Latino cooking or Hispanic cooking is letting your flavors develop and making sure that you're using enough of the flavor that it's bold and, and flavorful and it takes you somewhere else, okay? So, got the oil going. I'm gonna uh, get it nice and hot. And um, I think before I, I, I put all the chicken in there, I'm gonna take one piece and let it get in there so that I can hear it start to sizzle so that I know when it's where I, where I need it to be because we want a high heat on this. We wanna get a little bit of caramelization, which not burning. Okay, caramelization, a little bit of browning on there so that we can get that going. And you can hear it. And you should probably use a pretty high pot for this too because I see the oil splashing mm -hmm. out. So be careful with that too. Yeah, yeah, don't cook with the shirt off. <laughs> I know it's date night and all, but don't do it. Make just, sure you cover it. how festive you want to be. So we got a nice sizzle going there. So I'm going to go ahead and add all this chicken. And remember when you do, it's going to drop the temperature in the pan so it's gonna cool back down. So we wanna let it be and let it heat back up and start to catch that heat so that it goes back to, to the caramelization that we're talking about, all right? How long do you have to typically let it sit in there before it starts getting that caramelization on there? You know, it just depends on what kind of cooking apparatus you're cooking on. If you got an electric stove, a uh, gas stove, you know, gas is gonna cook more evenly and faster, I think, than an electric stove. Um, you know, I, it just depends, you know, I think, well, what uh, should we look for, for it to be done? You're going to look for, for, you can see the chicken in here starting to get a little white uh -huh. on the edges uh -huh. and you can start to smell the aromatic coming off. You can smell the chicken starting to cook and you're going to look for a golden brown color on there. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of people get nervous and they like to move it around a lot. It, yeah. it, you don't want to mess too much with it. Okay. Okay. If you do, it's going to start to uh, stick to the pan and you're going to miss that sear. Every time you stir it, you're cooling the pan back down. Okay. And then you're going to lose that heat and you're going to lose that caramelization that we're talking about, okay. right? I think my fear is I'm constantly stirring it because I, I think naturally that I'm going to burn it. So you're saying kind of leave it alone. Yeah, leave it alone. Let okay. it be. John Lennon. Okay. Okay. I like it. All right, so the chicken's starting to brown, and it's going to stick a little bit to the pan, and that's okay. What we want to do is just start to mix it up, and then I'm going to take it, I'm going to remove the pan from the heat so that it's not splashing and burning Cheryl if she has this tomato paste. Okay, you want to go ahead and scrape that in there? Sure. 
You add your tomato paste second because the paste, when you put it back on the heat, is also going to help to caramelize this chicken and start breaking it down and start infusing those flavors together. There you go. All right. Unimus. And this is a really good facial opportunity <laughs> if, you know. Clean your pores out. Yeah, if you need a little something else. Right. Okay, do you want me to stir? Or I'm no? bring okay. it back over to the heat. Okay, and then I'm just going to incorporate that chicken and that tomato paste together. All right, and it's a hot mess in there, and that's what we want. This is a, a, a as they say, it's Picadillo style. It's a, going to be shredded. It's going to be broken down and braised. All right, so we want this stuff to cook together. So next, we're going to add our julienne onions. Okay, Get that. I'll bring that right there. Put just cut them in. off. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And there's no time frame for this. Everything else is going to go in. The one thing you want to make sure is that the chicken, the tomato paste, and the onions get incorporated before you add other ingredients. And you don't want to put the garlic in with the oil because it's going to burn. We don't want burnt garlic in there. It's going to offset the whole dish, all right? Okay. Good? Yeah. All right. Slide this back on the heat. And just incorporate that. Get it all worked in. Okay. So next we're going to add our garlic. Um, I've got this chipotle seasoning, and we'll talk about that in a second, where to get it from. I like my food with kick. Cheryl does not, okay? So, in the recipe, I put two tablespoons of ground chipotle. If you want to cut back on the heat on this dish, cut it in half. Cut it to one tablespoon. We'll make it nice and mild for Mrs. Griller. Next, we're going to add our oregano our black pepper, a key ingredient in the tinga. Mix it. And then on these recipes that I'm turning in, I like to put on salt to taste. To taste has everything to do with your palate, all right? I don't want to put a measurement of salt because it might be too much for what you like. It might be too little for what you like. The best way to season with salt it's just put a, a, a little bit to cover the surface area now. Finish the dish, taste it, and if you need more salt, add a little bit more after it's cooked. This prevents over-salting, over-seasoning, and once there's too much salt in there, you can't go back. It's done. There's nothing you can do about it, right? So we'd rather have too little than too much. Before you plate the dish, taste it, adjust it, and go for it. Last ingredient is going to be our chicken stock. Save the container. All right. All right. And we're just going to mix that up. And this is all working together like a nice little stew. You can smell the chipotle in there, the smokiness of the chipotle. You can smell the onions, the garlic, the chicken, the tomato paste yeah, is giving it a great, great color, a real depth of flavor. Right? And this is going to complement our rice. Excellente. Yeah, absolutely. Cover. Cut your heat down to. Medium, medium, low if you're on an electric stove, three and a half to four and a half. Keep an eye on it. You know, this is another one of those things you don't want to walk away and, and start folding laundry or, you know, watching the uh, Gamecocks play on TV. You want to stay close attention, you know, stay by the stove, keep an eye on it, and make sure it doesn't get out of, out of hand. Every stove is different. No stove is the same. So if you're familiar with cooking on your stove at home, Hopefully you know where your where your your hot and your cold points are. You know, if not, just keep an eye on it. What we're looking for this is not really boiling it hard. That'll make the chicken tough and dry it out. We want to simmer it nice and easy and slow and low and let it take its time so that it stays juicy and delectable. And that uh, the chicken, when it starts to shred on its own, that's when you know you're good to go and you can pull it. And you got to be patient. I'm not very patient in the kitchen, so I'm notorious for turning it on 10 and then getting mad if it may not taste very good. So, definitely be patient. And on the opposite, I believe the two most important ingredients in any kitchen are time and temperature. And not time like the herb. Time like <laughs> right. time and temperature. It's everything. If you're making a, a, a hollandaise, if you're making a stew, yeah. if you're making a fried egg, time and temperature are everything. So... That's where we're at. Yeah, yeah. no, so good. It smells so good. Good, good. 
Okay, so real quick, um, I want to talk about uh, ingredients and where to get them. Okay, so everything that I used in these dishes or this dish today, these items, are readily available at any grocery store. Um, I did have to jump two of them to get everything. I, I think mainly because of the situation that's happening. There's a shortage of ingredients. There's logistics issues getting them there or whatnot. So um, the Badia brand is great for uh, uh, Mexican food and Latino cooking and Hispanic cooking. I love them. We use them at Cantina 76. That's uh, our favorite, my favorite seasonings to use. And they have a great selection. Um, this uh, Chipotle is just ground Chipotle, right? And um, real simple, easy to use, user-friendly. The Aneto is already ground. You can get this in the whole seed form, but if you get it ground, it's better for the rice, you don't have to pick through it or bite into anything crazy when you're done. Um, and of course the oregano is uh, readily available yeah, anywhere. Sure. Um, there is a difference between Mexican oregano and Italian oregano. The Italian oregano is, it's got a different flavor profile. Um, this is uh, Mexican oregano and that's what I use in the dish to keep it traditional. Um, your saffron is your rice threads, or your, um, I'm sorry, your thistle that comes from the saffron. And um, it's it's a little pricey, but a little goes a long way and it lasts a long time. And it's real easy, real easy to find. Um, uh, if you can't find it at the grocery store, you can go to a specialty market mm -hmm. and they, they have it. So no, no big deal, all right? Um, the peas for the rice, I strongly recommend using a fresh pea. You do not want to use canned peas if you can help it, frozen peas if that's all you can come across. Um, the two grocery stores I went to, which are right here in downtown Columbia, had these available. And the fresh pea, when you put it in the rice at the end, it's got color that pops and it's got crunch and good flavor. This is what a pea is supposed to taste like, okay? So this is what you want to use for the rice. All right, real quick, uh, we're going to talk about avocados. Um, it's not necessarily included in the recipe, but it's a great garnish for this dish and a nice nice uh, uh, thing to put on the side to, to kind of add a little color, add a little texture, something creamy and fatty, rich, but it's also very healthy, right? And um, your avocados, when you get them at the store, a lot of people have a hard time yes. understanding yes. what's the right avocado to use, okay? Uh, typically, the brighter the color of the avocado, the harder the avocado, it's not ripe it's not ready to go okay um, there's really no way to rush that you can't boil an avocado or rush rush it being ripe or ready you want to try to plan ahead and have that avocado already purchased green and very hard and sitting out on your counter so that it has a chance to ripen over two to three days is usually enough time. If you want to rush the process a little faster, you can use a brown paper bag, put it in there and keep it folded and it'll, it'll, it'll turn a little faster. Um, when you're testing the avocado to find out if you've got one that's ready or not, you want to check the texture. A good comparison is going to be using your hand. If you make a fist and you touch your hand and it's hard, the avocado is not right. If you're praying, and you touch your hand, the avocado is somewhat firm, but not giving a lot. That's where I like my avocados. They're gonna have the most color, the most flavor. If you want it very ripe for mashing for guacamole, you can open your hand and feel the inside of your thumb and it's nice and soft. That's where that avocado is gonna be. Uh, discoloration on the avocado is gonna happen if you throw it in the fridge and take it back out to ripen it. I don't refrigerate my avocados. I just don't really think that's the best practice for them. They're going to come out better if you keep them at room temperature, let the gases and stuff escape so that it's got nice color and nice texture, okay? Um, the other thing you have to remember with avocado, just like most fruit and vegetables, is you want to wash this, okay? There has been listeria outbreaks and um, they strongly recommend that you wash your avocados before you cut into them, okay? So when you cut into the avocado, always be careful not to cut your hand you're gonna hit it with the seed right there on your blade and spin the avocado around so that you get a, a nice cut on there. Twist the avocado and there you go, okay? When you go to get the seed out, this is dangerous. Yes, it Don't is. do this at home. Mm -mm. You lightly tap the seed with your blade of your knife and catch it, okay? If you're a little timid and you don't wanna do it, rest it on the counter and use that to get it out, all right? Um, 
there are things that they do with the seeds. There's nothing that we can do with it, but uh, uh, I know these days they're making straws and compostable, recyclable things out of these. So, you know, I don't know if you have that ability at home or not, okay? But um, when we go to plate the avocado, sorry, I forgot a spoon. When we go to plate the avocado, you're gonna use a spoon to scoop it out and just trace the skin in between the skin and the flesh of the avocado and you'll end up with a nice half, okay? You do that on both avocados. And for this dish, for my garnish, what I like to do is turn the avocado to its side, like so, all right? I'm gonna take my knife, and uh, Cheryl, it's okay. I'm gonna cut, like cut this nice and thin, all right? Super thin, all right? And just come across the avocado, paper thin. And if it gets a little disheveled, that's fine. It's not a big deal. All right. Next thing you're going to do is fold it sideways to make it straight, like a straight line. Okay. And then we're going to take it and spin it around. And it makes like an avocado flower. How's that look? And we'll scoop that up, salt and pepper it, and put it on the side of our dish when we go to serve our chicken tanga and rice. Cool? So good. Yes. Good, good. All right, so uh, right before we go to serve the rice, we're going to take the rice that's been sitting. It's still warm, still very warm. Right, sorry for you. Okay, right, thank sorry. you. And we're going to add the peas right before service because you don't want them changing color. You don't want them to lose their texture. Well, you and want the crunchiness. Absolutely, yeah. that fresh crunchiness. So we're going to dump the peas in and just mix those in. And uh, that rice is ready for service. Yeah, and it looks amazing, if you guys can tell. It's so good. All right, quick tip for cilantro garnish, all right? Cheryl, you can do this if you'd like. I like, It's very try. simple. So I want you to grab the cilantro by the bunch and hold it with your left hand if you're dominant as your right hand, all right? And you're gonna take the fork and I want you to take it and just kind of rest it in here without, don't, don't press it into the stem, just kind of rest it in there and start pulling it out to gently rake okay. the leaves off of the stem. And it'll give you something really nice and uh, loose, uh, loose to, garnish your plate with so you get a nice little smoky citrusy flavor off the cilantro oh so yeah so we're trying not to get too much of the stem in there. right and this is what you end up with and it. don't throw your stems out they're 100 percent usable they're great for pico de gallo for salsa salsa verde whatever don't throw your stems out it's beautiful yeah that looks great okay cool now we should be ready to plate now we're going to plate the dish the most exciting time most fun time and you get to have the most fun plate and, and plating is, is about what you want to share with your significant other. How high or low do you want this evening to be, okay? Key <laughs> things when you go to plate, all right? You try to center your ingredients, all right? You try to build height, and you try to keep the outside of the plate clean. That's what we do in our commercial restaurants and in, in, in fine dining and sort of. But what it does is it brings attention to everything in the center, and it highlights the food and the ingredients and the colors and all the hard work you did the story is told on that plate. I want everyone to know how nervous he is about this moment coming up. So, side note. Okay, right. ready? Go right ahead. Okay. Three spoons of rice in the center of the bowl. All right. That color's great. You got that nice yellow rice, the green peas going on. And I did have a lesson on this. If anyone wants to know, you, you put it in your spoon. You go right up. Go right to the side and go right down. That is the lesson that I was informed before play started. <laughs> All right, one more, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's about six ounces of rice and four to six ounces of, of tinga. A nice full meal. You don't want to have to keep going back and forth. So. Okay. All right. So we take our bowl of rice. You're going to take your, your chicken. Make sure you get a nice even portion in there. Lots of sauce onions scoop from the bottom so you get all that good good stuff that we made took our time to make nice big chunks of shredded chicken get a little sauce on there because the sauce is boss all right so let's talk about garnishes okay i wanted to put some fresh avocado in there we put our little avocado rosettes that we made earlier right to the side okay and that's going to add a little bit of cooling down from the uh, chipotle, all right? We're gonna take these uh, cilantro leaves 
and sprinkle them around because that's going to add flavor and color and a little bit of texture. All right, um, over here I've got some crema. You can get your store-bought crema. It's by your sour cream and, and dairy aisle at the grocery store. Um, I add a little bit of salt and some lime zest to it to kick it up because I, I don't like anything normal. Cheryl will tell you that. I like yeah. to amp things up. That's so right. We go big. I'm just going to put a nice else. dollop right in the center. And then I'm going to put a lime squeeze right next to the dish. And there you have it. That's your uh, yellow rice and chicken tinga. So I love grillo. That's right. So good. Has the plating, has the rice. It's beautiful. All right, all it's right. Beautiful. Success, we got a lot of color. success. That's right. Great job. Yes. Fist pump. Well, we had a great time tonight. So uh, much speaking. fun, so much fun. Thank you for having us in your homes. Uh, thank you for uh, the Richland Library for having us uh, in this amazing kitchen out in the Northeast. So we're Very super cool. appreciative of that. And I'm um, always fun having date night with my hub. So Excellent. cheers to you. Cheers. cheers to you guys. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Enjoy.